Hello and welcome to this edition of World at War. My name is Mohammed Saleh. For the first time in its history, Iran states a direct attack on Israel from its soil as retaliation for the bombing of its embassy in Damascus on the 1st of April. There was panic over the Israeli skies as over 300 drones, ballistic and cruise missiles flew from Iran and onto the Israeli airspace. Sirens rang out across Israel and loud explosions were heard over Jerusalem as the anti-air defense systems kicked in. According to the Israelis, they managed to shoot down nearly 99% of all projectiles that were fired by Iran with the assistance of the United States and Britain. For decades, Iran and Israel have engaged in a shadow war, with Israel using Mossad to carry out assassinations of the top Iranian scientists, while Tehran has relied on its proxies to flex its muscles in the region. But these airstrikes by Iran have changed the very nature of the Tehran Tel Aviv conflict. So is this now the beginning of a new war spread across the Middle East? Our next board gets you the details. The Iranian attack began at midnight. In wave after wave, Iranian drones and missiles pierced through the dark night. The airspace of Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon and Israel were shut down and all flights diverted. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu put out a video message that this was a scenario for which Israel had been preparing for. Citizens of Israel, in recent years, and especially in recent weeks, Israel has been preparing for a direct attack by Iran. Our defensive systems are deployed. We are ready for any scenario, both defensively and offensively. The state of Israel is strong. The IDF is strong. The public is strong. And soon enough, in city after Israeli city, sirens began to wave. Streaks of light of the Iranian drones and missiles were witnessed over even the most well-guarded Israeli cities such as Tel Aviv. Dramatic videos of the Iranian missiles flying past over Jerusalem went viral over social media. Israel activated its multi-layered air defense systems that include the Arrow, the David Sling and the Iron Dome to shoot down the Iranian missiles and drones. There are reports of some Iranian ballistic missiles of being intercepted even outside of the Earth's atmosphere. And as expected, Israel's all-weather ally, the United States, along with Britain and France, also used their anti-air defense systems to shoot down the Iranian drones and missiles. Well, last night, Iran launched a barrage of missiles and attack drones across the Middle East towards Israel. This was a dangerous and unnecessary escalation, which I've condemned in the strongest terms. Thanks to an international coordinated effort, which the United Kingdom participated in, almost all of these missiles were intercepted, saving lives not just in Israel, but in neighboring countries like Jordan as well. The RAF sent additional planes to the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones and I want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger to protect civilians. The Iranian attack lasted for five long hours in which Iran fired 170 drones, 120 ballistic missiles and 30 low-flying cruise missiles. Israel claims it managed to shoot down nearly 99% of all projectiles fired by Iran. Although there are reports that the Nevatim Air Base in southern Israel was struck. There were scenes of celebrations in Iran over Tehran's strong response to the Israeli bombing of the Iranian embassy in Damascus. The punishment of Israel must be done completely because the cruelty that has been done to the people of Gaza must not stay unresponded. Joe Biden cut short his visit to Delaware 
and returned to Washington to speak with his national security team about the unfolding situation in the Middle East. The American president also got on a phone call with the Israeli Prime Minister and reaffirmed America's ironclad relationship with Israel. But interestingly, according to reports in the American media, Biden also told Benjamin Netanyahu that the United States would not support any Israeli counterattack on Iran. As the sun rose up, the extent of the damage inflicted by the Iranian airstrikes became clear. A seven-year-old Bedouin girl was wounded by the shrapnel of an interceptor missile. Iran says it carried out the airstrikes on Israel as per Article 51 of the UN Charter after the bombing of the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Dozens of drones, cruise ships and ballistic missiles at appropriate intervals were able to destroy these deep layers of seemingly reassuring air defense of the Zionist regime and affect the air defense alliance between America, France and the Zionist regime and reduce it. But on the other hand, Israel has insisted that this campaign isn't over. But what most definitely is over are the days of a shadow war between Israel and Iran. And the volatile region has been pushed one step closer to a contest that will redefine the balance of power in the Middle East. On the 11th of April, Russian airstrikes destroyed the largest power generating plant in Kiev region of Ukraine. A total of 82 missiles and drones were fired, of which Ukraine claims to have managed to shoot down about 18 missiles and 39 drones. Russia had also fired six Kinzhal hypersonic missiles. But Ukraine simply hasn't got the air defense systems to intercept hypersonic missiles that Russia has been firing at it. As a result, the Tripilska thermal power plant, the largest supplier of electricity to Kiev, Cherkasy and Zaitomir regions was completely destroyed. Centenergo, the company that generates nearly about 20% of all Ukrainian energy needs, has said that in the past three weeks, it has witnessed the most intense and the most targeted airstrikes on Ukraine's power infrastructure. The Kremlin has said that these airstrikes on Ukraine's power infrastructure are meant to avenge the Ukrainian campaign of specifically targeting Russian oil refineries. So as this war of attrition continues unabated into its third year, why are power facilities and oil refineries the new targets for both the Russian and the Ukrainian missiles? On export, Get you more details. Thick plumes of black smoke rose over Kiev. As the sirens blared and people rushed into the underground metro stations to take cover, what became clear was the Russian strategy where it was specifically targeting Ukraine's power infrastructure. The Tripilska thermal power plant was completely destroyed by a barrage of missiles that struck one after another, and Kiev that is now fighting the Russian onslaught on its own, had no air defense systems to protect its key infrastructure. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who was at a summit in Vilnius at the time, did not mince words. While the United States is mired in its domestic politics on the question of sending military aid to fight against Russia, Volodymyr Zelensky insisted that the time to act is now. We don't have our own air defense comparable to Patriot. It just doesn't exist. I want to tell you that we need time. We need help from our partners. We won't need Patriot systems forever. We will definitely be able to produce our own systems. We started working on this. I believe we will be able to do it. But during this time, we don't want to lose people. After much hemming and hawing, the United States on the 10th of April announced that it will send about $138 million worth of Hawk air defense systems to equip Ukraine to defend itself against the Russian drone and cruise missile attacks. The United States has been shipping Hawk interceptor missiles to Ukraine since 2022 as an upgrade to the shoulder launch Stinger air defense missile systems. But Ukraine has said that this is just not enough and it needs the Patriot air missile defense systems to guard itself from the Russian hypersonic missiles. A sentiment echoed by the NATO chief, Jens Stoltenberg. 
Delays in delivery of air defenses will allow Russian missiles to hit more uh, targets, and delays in delivery of ammunition will allow Russia to press along the front line. Ukraine uh, simply cannot wait. Uh, it needs air defenses, ammunition, and aid now. The Russia-Ukraine war has undergone a qualitative change. It is no longer a contest of artillery firepower. Instead, some NATO nations who are now willing to send the slightly longer-range missiles has meant that Kiev has been striking targets deep inside Russia. For instance, on the 9th of April, Ukraine struck a Russian aviation factory in the Voronezh region deep inside the Russian territory. Kiev claims that it used the domestically produced long-range drones to carry out this attack. Kiev is also using its long-range drones and missiles to accomplish what the Western sanctions have failed so far. There is a campaign by Ukraine to strike at Russia's economic and logistical sinews. In the last few weeks and months, there has been a concerted campaign by Kiev to repeatedly strike at Russia's oil refineries. Consider this, Russia earns 40% of its revenue from the export of its crude oil and petroleum products. And in the Ukrainian strike so far, Kiev has destroyed almost 900,000 barrels a day of refining capacity of Russia. Russia has an installed refining capacity of almost 5 million barrels per day. But the destroyed refining capacity is beginning to tell in the Russian finances. Western sanctions on shipping and insurance were easily circumvented by Russia by using its fleet of shadow oil tankers to the extent that Russia's oil exports had remained unchanged. But this new strategy of Ukraine to target Russian refineries has raised some very serious concerns for the military strategists at the Kremlin. The civil war in Myanmar is at a major tipping point. The military junta has faced one defeat after another, ever since the ethnic rebels had staged a combined counter-offensive starting last October. And now, the Karen National Union, a key rebel group, claims to have overrun Myawadi, a key trading town along the border with Myanmar. And what is worse, about 200 Myanmar junta military personnel also reportedly abandoned their military base and then fled into Thailand. And the Thai authorities are now considering whether to grant sanctuary to the junta soldiers. So why has the Myanmar junta, which has an arsenal of formidable weapons, been simply unable to stop the surge of the ethnic rebels across the country? Our next board gets you the details. Pitched battles are being fought in the dead of the night. Armed with light weapons and often crudely manufactured explosives, Myanmar's ethnic rebels have managed to inflict one defeat after another, capturing large swathes of territory from Junta's hands. On the 11th of April, the anti-Junta rebels, who melt away into the jungles, at the sight of the Myanmarese Thatmadaw's heavy weapons, staged an audacious attack. Using guerrilla tactics that have been mastered over decades, the ethnic rebels attacked the key border town of Miawadi. And before reinforcements could be brought in, overwhelmed the junta soldiers, forcing at least 200 of them to flee into Thailand for safety. Miawadi is a crucial border town that connects Myanmar to Thailand for trade. Just last month, the Karen National Union, one of Myanmar's oldest rebel groups, had forced over 600 Tatmadaw soldiers and their families to surrender. And now the locals expect retribution from the junta, which comes in the form of heavy bombing with the use of fighter jets and helicopters. On homes, schools, hospitals, prayer halls, or any other bit of infrastructure which the Myanmar junta suspects could be the hideout of the ethnic rebel forces. The fear of junta retribution has sparked an exodus. An average of over 4,000 Myanmar citizens are now crossing over into Thailand every day. In Myanmar, the junta used airplane strikes. I couldn't sleep at home, so I went to take shelter at the temple in Myanmar. 
I'm afraid I feel safer on this side of the border. Two of us, mother and son, chose to come here first. My husband will follow. They cannot bomb Thailand. The steady stream of people pouring into Thailand has sparked concerns in Bangkok. Thai Prime Minister Stretha Thavesin has said that it is time for the Myanmar junta to wake up and see the writing on the wall. I think we all know that the current regime is starting to lose some strength. Okay? Let me propose you with a different idea that when somebody is losing, do you crush them or you talk to them? I think it's the latter. Yeah, even they, if they are losing, but they have the power, they have the weapon. Okay, but if they know they are losing, or weaker than their opponent, maybe it's a time to reach out and make a deal. And maybe that's, the, that's probably the time so that they can realize that maybe the wise decision can be made uh, having the people of Myanmar at heart. The military junta at this moment controls just about 40% of Myanmar's territory. Ever since Operation 1027 began in October last year, the Tatmadaw has faced serious manpower issues. The morale in the Tatmadaw is low. Thousands of soldiers have surrendered without a fight, including six brigadier generals, resulting in three of the brigadier generals being sentenced to death by a military tribunal while three others have been handed out life sentences. On the 10th of February, Myanmar activated its decades-old conscription law by which men and women of fighting age can be drafted into the armed forces for a period of two years, which during national emergencies can be extended to five years. This is the clearest indicator that Myanmar junta is struggling and for the first time since 1962 has been pushed on the back foot by the ethnic rebels. The Vienna Convention on Consular Relations is an international treaty that was signed in 1963. According to this treaty, embassies are inviolable and the local law enforcement agencies of a host nation simply cannot enter into the premises of an embassy without the express consent of the head of the mission. In fact, the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations states that the premises of the embassy will be treated as part of the sovereign territory of the nation that has the embassy there. And even diplomats have what is known as diplomatic immunity, making them exempt from some of the laws of a host nation, besides being protected from arrest or detention. But all of these rules were thrown out of the window when on the 5th of April, heavily armed and balaclava-clad police personnel of Ecuador stormed into the Mexican embassy in the city of Quito. The dramatic CCTV footage of the Ecuadorian police intimidating the Mexican embassy staff as they forcefully arrested and then dragged out the former vice president of Ecuador from the Mexican embassy has now gone viral. But what led to this dramatic incident? And what action has Mexico taken over the storming of its embassy in Ecuador? Our next port gets you the details. An embassy is not a war zone. But this is what played out inside the Mexican embassy in Ecuador in the middle of the night on the 5th of April. The Mexican embassy staff who tried to intervene were roughed up as Jorge Glass, the former Ecuadorian vice president, was lifted up off his feet and then dragged out in the most unceremonious manner. incident sparked an immediate diplomatic spat. The Mexican president showed these images in his daily press conference. El this was an assault on our embassy and a government doesn't do something like this if it doesn't feel like it has the support from other governments and powers. For this reason, we will bring it to the International Court of Justice. The Mexican foreign minister soon announced the suspension of diplomatic relations with Ecuador. 
Mexico announces the immediate suspension of diplomatic relations with Ecuador. In this sense, Mexican diplomatic personnel in Ecuador will leave the country immediately. Mexico expects Ecuador to offer the necessary guarantees for the departing Mexican personnel. Mexico will appeal to the International Court of Justice to hold Ecuador accountable for violations of international law. And once the diplomatic staff returned home, they recounted the terrible ordeal they went through in the middle of the night. But there was more drama that was unfolding in Quito. Jorge Glass, who has been twice convicted on charges of corruption, promptly began a hunger strike as he was taken inside the Guayaquil prison. There are reports that he even attempted suicide inside the prison, for which he was taken to a hospital for medical checkups. But the hospital soon discharged him and he was back in prison again. Jorge Glass has been offered political asylum by Mexico, which is why he had been residing in the Mexican embassy since last December. Other high-profile individuals who found asylum in a foreign embassy include the likes of the WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, who walked into the Ecuadorian embassy in London and stayed there from 2012 till 2019. Former Afghan president Mohammad Najibullah sought shelter at the compound of a United Nations mission in Kabul after he was removed from office in 1992. Eric Honecker, the former leader of East Germany, had sought refuge in the Chilean embassy in Moscow in 1991. Storming the embassy of a foreign nation is a serious affair. And now, Mexico has dragged Ecuador to the International Court of Justice, demanding its suspension from the United Nations. It was meant to be a celebratory gathering of Eid al-Fitr, where about a thousand people had congregated at the Clara Mohammed Square in Philadelphia to mark the end of the holy month of Ramadan. Lawn chairs picnic tables and toys had been set up. Families were dressed in their best. Families with children and the elderly were in attendance for the Eid al-Fitr prayers. When suddenly, the sound of gunshots ripped through the air, sparking widespread panic and chaos. People ducked to avoid the bullets and family members rushed to grab their loved ones. But the question is, who opened the fire in this festive gathering in Philadelphia? Our next board gets you more details. I panicked. I, I was scared. My heart was palpitating. And there was utter disbelief amongst the scattered crowd of people. After having fasted for a month, an estimated thousand members of the Muslim community had gathered in the front lawns of the Philadelphia Mosque for the Eid al-Fitr festivities. But at about 2:30 p.m. in the afternoon, loud gunshots rang out. According to the police, who arrived at the spot immediately on being informed about an active shooter scenario, at least 30 rounds had been fired. The Clara Mohammed Square, which in the morning had been bustling with festivities, was suddenly full of debris, of shoes that had been left behind, water bottles, strollers and cushions. Thomas Allen, who was at the Philadelphia Mosque at the time of the incident, describes the horror of what unfolded. Once it happened, just women and children were screaming, everybody was running. You don't see something like this coming. It was just, just pandemonium, just, just wow. And we're hearing that they were children. You know, they were children. And it's a sad thing. Uh, this is the holy month of Ramadan. All my years of living in Philadelphia, I've never seen nothing like this. Um, especially at the mass years. As much crime as it may be in Philadelphia, it was always separated from the mass years. This is the first time I've ever seen something like this. As more police cars rolled in, the shooters attempted to flee. Three males and one female were taken into custody. Four weapons were recovered from them. A police officer engaged a 15-year-old male suspect and shot him in the shoulder and leg. The injured suspect was then shifted to a hospital. The shooting at the Eid al-Fitr gathering sent shockwaves through the surrounding Muslim community. But the local police who are investigating this case say that the shooting did not specifically target the religious gathering. Instead, the police claim it was a case of two gangs who were also present in the vicinity who exchanged gunfire. Anyone can have access to come into this event, so it was not a ticketed event. And so clearly we had some individual who decided to use this as a way, to, I mean, just like anything else we see. 
when we see individuals who are beefing and going at each other, oftentimes they don't care where they see, them at, see each other at. And, and so in this case, clearly they saw something going on in the park. What that was, it caused two factions to start to pull out guns and shoot at each other. The investigation will we'll be looking into that. In total, five people have been arrested for opening fire in the congregation, of which four are said to be juveniles. The United States of America is notorious for gun violence and mass shootings. And this incident is just another one where gunfire erupted in what was essentially a safe, family-friendly, festive religious gathering. With that is a wrap on this edition of World at War. And if you want to reach out to me with any comments, feedback or suggestions, please feel free to do so on the ID that you're seeing on your screens. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week.